So Mark, I'm just gonna pray for you before we, I hand you off. All right, Jesus, I thank you so much for Mark. I thank you for um, the way that you have just continued to birth this uh, this journey just from your heart. And so God, we just, we pray from your throne room this morning that your river would just flow um, to our hearts this morning, that we would hear what you have for us to say. You would speak through Mark's mind. We just pray for clarity in mind and clarity in thought and words. Um, and I just bind up every like spirit of distraction this morning that we're able to enter into what it is you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. Thanks, babe. Well, you can tell it's been one of those mornings when I bring my child sippy cup as my water bottle. And yes, I was, somebody peed on my shoe. <laughs> Just one of those mornings. When we're both serving, they're here at 7.32. Uh, wow. Well, here's an interesting thing to start off the morning. If you drive a BMW with the license plate CKDP918, your lights are on. Now, I'm kind of like, it's only another hour, and that's German engineering. Like, if it can't keep the lights on for an hour, get a refund. And get a Toyota, because it can. <laughs> hey. And you don't want to miss the intro, because then you're going to have no idea where I'm going. Anyways, you might want to turn that off. I do have booster cables, though, so if you can wait till after Newcomer Coffee, because I'm so excited for Newcomer Coffee, uh, I can give you a boost with my Toyota. <laughs> hey, as we're continuing on this journey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever just felt like you were so overwhelmed by the amount of information that you were processing? Maybe it was a book you were reading, maybe it was a blog, maybe it was a class, maybe it was a website, maybe whatever it was, have you ever just felt like this is just too much information? Maybe you're a parent and you've been, you've been kind of like me reading parenting books and you're like, why can't they just tell me the same thing? It's like you read one book and they're telling you one thing and the other book is the other thing. And one book it's like, never spank your kids. The other one's like, it's the forgotten art form. It's coming back, right? And you're just like, what do I do with this, right? And you're reading like dieted book, dieting books and trying to figure out what to do. And it's like, don't try and save money by, buy, by not buying organic. Like you have to get organic food. You can't feed your children that other poison, right? And others are like, it's the same thing, same field, different label, right? And you're just like, what do I do with all this information? Maybe you've had this when you're looking at finances, like, do I invest in this? And you talk to one professional and they're like, absolutely. You talk to another professional, absolutely. You're like, I don't even know what the letters after your name mean, but who do I trust, right? Like, there's just so much information out there and so often it just disagrees with itself. Maybe you've had this experience with faith. You explored faith. You read a book and you're like, wow, okay. Then you read another book. You're like, okay, now I don't know. And then another book. And you talked to a person. And then you came to a church and then you went to another church. And then you stayed long enough. And it was like, I feel like two months ago you were saying this and now you're saying this and my mind's gonna explode. It's like there's so much information. And I feel like for the first time in history, we live in a time where there's so much information and yet we so desire wisdom. That there's so many words out there to be had, whether verbally or to be read on a screen or in a book. You have so much. You have unlimited information at your fingertips. But the thing that I so long for is actually wisdom and help in making the right decision. There's a friend of mine who used to work in the media industry said her boss, who was uh, the head of a newspaper, used to always have this saying, which was, you can find a source to substantiate anything you want to write about. Which was kind of terrifying when I heard that. But it's true, there's people who have thoughts about everything. And so you have all this information, you have all these opinions, you have all these ideas, and yet it's like, but what, what's true and what's wise? And how do I know if I'm making the right decision? I don't know about you, but sometimes I just feel paralyzed trying to make a decision. I'm like, I don't know. If I do it this way, these people all think I'm doing the right thing and these people think I'm doing the wrong thing and vice versa. It's like, so where do we find wisdom? Now it's interesting because now there's some 30 something year old guy on stage talking about wisdom and you're like, that seems ironic. It's true. But today we're going to talk about something that's a little bit different because we're not going to talk about the best kind of human wisdom and we're not going to compare educational degrees. We're going to talk about something called supernatural wisdom. And for some of you, that immediately sets off the alarm bells and like the weird alert, right? Like that just, I, I can't. And others of you are like, no, this is, this is why I'm here. Like, come on, bring it on. Wherever you are in that category, here's the thing that we can all agree on, whether Jesus person or not, follower or not, you believe in God or not, or you're skeptical, you have questions, wherever you're at, the reality is, is if there was a God, and if he was all-knowing, and if he was perfectly loving, and we could engage with him, and he would answer us when we asked, we'd take it. And I talk to people all the time who aren't Jesus followers, who don't believe in God, and they're like, but if there was a God, I'd love to know, I'd love some help, you know, or I, I know there isn't one because I never find any help. But the reality is, if there was, we'd take it. If we could get some clarity on, God, wh where are we supposed to go and how are we supposed to direct our lives and where are we supposed to invest and where are we supposed to you know, really spend time with our families or our kids? Or our, if we could get that kind of supernatural wisdom wherever you're from, you'd take it. Because reality is, is we, we need help. 
that there's just so much information out there, and yet the reality is, is we so desperately don't just want information, but we want wisdom. And so today we're continuing on our journey, and we've been, if you're just joining us on this journey that I'm so excited about, we're going through a letter written to a church in a place called Corinth. And the letter is called 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For those of you that like to read along on your device or on a paper Bible, um, or if you don't have one, don't worry, just follow along on the screen. I'll have everything up there for you. But as we kind of go on this journey, we're looking at a letter that was written 2,000 years ago, and yet the thing I'm discovering every week for myself and as I talk to many of you is, wow, that is so incredibly relevant to the things that we're going through because cultures change and styles have changed, but the human condition hasn't. And the way we relate to each other and the way that we struggle for relationship, I mean, 2,000 years later, and we haven't perfected human relationships. And so there's, I believe, this supernatural wisdom that we're going to discover today from the scriptures that is so incredibly life-changed that I'm just so excited to go through it with you today. And so as we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to just give you a little bit of context. And if you're just jumping in, don't worry, it'll start to make sense. But basically, this letter was written to a church, and the author isn't with them at the time. And there's things going on in the church that aren't so great. Like, there's some messed up things going on. And that newsflash for if you're new to church, like, churches are messed up. We got a lot of messed up people, including me. And the author is writing to them, and he's like, guys, hey, I heard about this, and what about this, and what about this? And he's challenging them and calling them on things. And they lived in a time where people loved knowledge. There were these traveling teachers that would go around and teach philosophy, and people would be like, I'm with this teacher. No, this teacher's the one that's got it, right? And they would constantly be doing that. And they kind of brought that into the church, and they're kind of doing that with the teachers. And they're like, I'm with this guy, and I'm with this guy. And so one of the pastors, his name's Paul, he's kind of writing to them. He's like, guys, what are you doing? You're not with him or with him. You're with Jesus. Like, we're God followers, not human followers. Don't get it twisted. And in the midst of that, that's where we interrupt this letter for today's message where we're jumping in today. And he's continuing on that theme of these people who just want to speak with eloquent human wisdom. And he kind of goes after that. And he's like, mm, there's more to it than that. We're going to talk about supernatural wisdom. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. This is where Robin ended last week. And we're going to pick it up a little bit. So Paul's writing, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. He's like, guys, it wasn't important to me to sound smart. That wasn't my goal. He said, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's like, guys, the thing that I wanted you to know above everything else is that God of the, the God of the universe wrote himself into human history in the person of Jesus, and he loves us so much he was willing to give his life on our behalf. He's like, that's the thing. He's like, not that I didn't know anything else. He's like, but that was the thing that I knew was the game changer. And we're gonna discover why that was so important for him to communicate to some of the real smart people in town. He's like, guys, this is so important. He's like, nothing else is as important as this. And last week, Robin taught us so brilliantly. She's like, and he called it out. He's like, I realize this message that God would write himself into human history and give his life is moronic. And that was really cool to learn how to say moron in 2000 year old ancient Greek. Wasn't that cool? Okay, I appreciated it. I took notes. Anyways, but that, it was just like, it was like, I realize that this is moronic. I realize that this is foolish and it sounds crazy. He's like, but I have a different category that I'm, me I'm measuring this all by. And he continues. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. He's like, guys, I wasn't interested in human wisdom, there was something else I wanted to communicate to you. To which some of you are like, see, this is why I can't be a Jesus follower. It just feels anti-intellectual. And we talked about that all about that in September with the series, My Problem with God, which you're welcome to go on YouTube or on our podcast and catch up on. But we talk very clearly about how we as Jesus followers love education. We love learning. We think it's so important. We think some, some of the disciplines like science, history, philosophy, sociology, when you study those, we actually discover God. It's incredible. As you study all the created things, you start to discover more and more about our creator. And so we don't ignore those things, but he's saying it wasn't just about human knowledge and attainment and the letters after my, my name. There was something beyond that that I was trying to communicate to you, and it was from God. It wasn't just human logic. Something beyond human wisdom. And then he continues, and we'll get to that in a second, but then he continues, and he says something kind of strange. He says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. I'll come back to that but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He's like, guys, we do have a wisdom as Jesus followers, and it's not just the wisdom that's out there. He said, it's something different. It's something different that we have now. 
But it's a, we'll go back one, just back up there for a second. I want to highlight one word. He says, the wisdom among the mature. Many people read this and they think he's talking about mature Jesus followers, right? Like there's an immature and a mature Jesus follower. But in this specific passage, that is not what Paul's talking about. If you read this whole passage, Paul is constantly paralleling Jesus followers, non-Jesus followers, Jesus followers, non-Jesus followers, Jesus followers, non-Jesus followers. And he always has different word pictures that he associates with the Jesus followers and the non-Jesus followers. And in this passage, he's writing to the church in Corinth where there's some real messed up things going on and he calls all Jesus followers mature. Okay, so if anyone's ever told you're not mature, be like, according to the Bible, I'm a Jesus follower, so I'm mature, okay? Which is like, it's already weird, because it's like, but Paul, you already told us that they're not really acting all that mature. In fact, Robin highlighted that when we get later, it's gonna get real freaky. Like, there's some real messed up stuff that's going on in this church, stuff that makes the non-Jesus people even blush. They're like, what? Like, it's really sketchy. And so he's like, but he's calling all the Jesus followers mature, but they're not mature. And so some people kind of like the other thing he said is like, is he being sarcastic? Is this sarcasm? Like, yeah, real mature, great. No, no. No, he's genuinely calling them mature. What's happening here? Let me give you an example. Again, it's gonna involve kids. I have kids. It's the only thing I see besides coffee, right? <laughs> My kids are amazing. My kids are so loving, right? They do things sometimes, and like, you know, they, they show up, and it's like, I saved my other cheese string for you, Papa. And I'm like, the other half, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so wonderful. That happens like a certain fraction percentage of the time. <laughs> then there's the rest of, you know, life where there's messy things going on. And so sometimes my kids do things, and I have to correct them. I'm like, hey, no, we don't hit, we don't yell, and we don't bite, and we don't spit, and we don't, you know, and on and on and on it goes. Maybe you've had to do that too, right? And, and sometimes I, I actually take them in my arms, I'm like, hey. If I don't lose my cool, and I just just come and breathe, like Jesus, help me, help me, and I just take them and I'm like, hey, Grayson, hey, Kaya, that's not who you are. You are loving, and you are wise, and you are kind. No, I am not kind. I am rude, and you are Rudy stupid. I'm like, did you just call me Rudy stupid? Like, like what? Like yes, right? It's like this is thing that goes on, and yeah, I'm like, no, 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 Greg, Greg, no, Kaya, no, no, you are loving. And you are kind. Are they being loving and kind in that moment? No. But I know they have the ability to be loving and kind. I know it's in them. And so I'm calling forward that destiny. Even though in that moment they're not, I'm calling out something that I know is inside of them. And we're gonna put a bookmark on this idea of being mature and what Paul's doing here. But here's the the, the glimpse of it. That Paul is calling out something inside these Jesus people. In fact, every single Jesus person from that moment on, he's saying, you're mature and you're wise. To which you're like, but they're not mature and they're not wise. They're doing really dumb things. How does that work? And we'll get back to that. Just place a bookmark on that word mature and why in the world Paul would call people who are acting unwise and immature, mature, okay? Then he continues. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. He's like, we declare God's wisdom, which is the part that Robin talked about last week. And the God wisdom was, it's something you didn't expect. It's that Jesus came into the earth in human form and then gave his life for all. Everyone's like, like we didn't see that coming. Even the religious people, the political leaders, they didn't see that coming. And Paul even calls it out. He's like, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The Romans didn't realize it. Even the religious leaders, who had memorized the scriptures, they didn't see it. And Paul's like, no, duh, it was hidden. It's like hindsight's 2020. You can go through the Old Testament and find foreshadowings of Jesus, but it was hidden up until that point. Until we understand it in Jesus, we didn't understand that Jesus was coming. We didn't understand it in that way, that he would come in that way. They were expecting some riding on a horse warrior who's gonna come and fight their battle. Instead, they found a savior who's gonna give his life on behalf of another, a life given on behalf of the other. Something that all people in the world are drawn to, one life given for another. And then he continues, and I love this. He says, however, as it is written, he quotes back, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, no human mind has conceived, not even the really smart people. Nobody could have figured this out, the things God has prepared for those who love him. So here's what Paul's doing. He's not saying, you idiots, how did you not see this one coming? How did you not know? How did you not figure it out? He's like, guys, it surprised everybody. Everybody, the political leaders, the religious leaders, everybody, everybody was completely shocked by this reality. And then he continues in verse 10. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit, by his spirit, by his spirit. Do you know why I love that? Because it tells me 
that there's no IQ threshold to being a Jesus follower. It tells me that there's no amount of education that you need. There's no amount of money that you need. There's no like standard level of mental health that you must reach before you can understand what God is like. It tells me that no matter what disability you may have or are struggling with, it tells me that even if you struggle with dyslexia and can never read the word of the Bible, that you can encounter and experience the presence of the living God. That is incredible news that anyone can experience the gift of God because of the spirit of God. That's not a reward for the amount of education you have, for the amount of money you have. It's not a reward for being born in this country versus that country. It's the reason why I'm always amazed, but not surprised when I continue to hear stories out of Muslim countries where you're not even legally allowed to enter as a Jesus follower, let alone say the name of Jesus and the death penalty is a result if you do. And yet Muslims are coming to faith and telling their stories and they're saying, I had a dream. And the spirit of God revealed Jesus to me. And it's the reason why, and I'm not even kidding when I tell you this, that Christian missions organizations are legitimately taking out Facebook ads that simply say, did you have a dream of Jesus? And putting them in these countries. That it's incredible the way that the spirit of God works, that he's not bound by educational limits or requirements or abilities or even ages. That he can work even in the lives of children because things are revealed by the spirit of God not by how hard we work, not by how smart we are. That Jesus actually says, the way children understand this, you should value that. Now, if you're kind of lost, you're like, what? Hidden, spirit, unwise, morons, like what's happening here? And sometimes I feel like Paul does this in his letters. He kind of like pauses and he's like, time for a word picture, right? Like, I think I may have lost some people, which is usually me. So I have to study this all week. The spirit, so now he's like, let me just, let me just explain the spirit. Because that just, Christians say, oh, thank the spirit of God. Welcome the spirit of God. It's like, what does that mean? It sounds weird. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And then he's like, he asks this question. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? Listen, nobody knows what anybody's thinking. Nobody knows what's going on the inside of you unless you tell them. You can die. They can do an autopsy. They can find out everything about your physiological self, but they will never know what you were thinking unless you reveal it to them. That's why Netflix is making a killing on all these documentaries called Inside the Mind of You Fill in the Blank. Right? It's like, it's like, what were they thinking? How is it that they were getting drafted to the NFL on this day and the day before they were killing all these people? Like, what was happening? Like, how do we get inside their mind and try and figure it out? And let's talk to this person and this person. Did you know that? Right? It's like, we're so desperately trying to get in their minds. Some of you parents have teenagers and you're just like, if I could just get in their mind for like two minutes, it would all make sense. Or maybe it wouldn't make any sense. Right? But you're like, I just so want to know what they're thinking. And Paul's like, listen, listen, listen. You cannot understand what people are thinking unless they reveal it to you. It is hidden in the core of their being and their spirit, and their soul, and you will never know. And this is the word picture that Paul's kind of unpacking for us. And he says this, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. You don't know what God's thinking. I don't know what God's thinking. People were always throughout history trying to figure out what God was thinking. In fact, the book of Job is an amazing story. And it's this guy who has this horrible tragedy in his life. And his friends are like, well, here's what happened. And here's what God's doing. And here's what God's doing. And this is why. And he's punishing you. And then God shows up in the story. And he's like, excuse me? Were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I, and he just kind of lays it out. He's like, you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't have a clue what's going on here. And Paul in this moment is saying, like, listen, listen, we did not know what God was like until Jesus showed up, until we received the spirit, until we understood. And he clarifies this. He says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. He's like, Jesus followers, I'm talking to you right now. He's like, you receive the spirit of God. That's God's gift. When you become a Jesus follower, when you decide, when you get baptized, when you go through that process of saying, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live in relationship with you. God gives us his spirit. And so he says this, he says, the spirit of the world, the spirit who's come from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. He's like, if you don't have the spirit, you will never be able to understand what God is like and what God is doing. That's why I talk to people sometimes and they're like, I, I don't think the spirit of God speaks to people. I think we have the Bible and we're good. And I'm like, have you read the Bible? It says that without the spirit, so that, like you won't even understand what the Bible has to say because the spirit will make it clear to us. And that's what we have. No wonder Paul calls the Jesus followers mature. They're not acting mature, but he's like, it's in you. 
You are Jesus followers. You have the spirit of God. The spirit of God that searches the deep things of God and knows everything about him is actually inside of you. And yet many Jesus followers kind of, you know, receive the spirit and then kind of lock him in the basement and close our ears and it's like, okay, I'll just wait. He's just the seal waiting, holding me for heaven. And we miss out on the fact that, no, he's with us. And Paul's like, no, no, no. He's with us. And then Paul continues. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words. And Paul's like, guys, as a pastor, he's like, when I'm writing to you, when I'm teaching you, when I'm praying for you, I'm not just using the sharpest ideas of the day. I'm not just using the sociology and the philosophy and the science that I've learned. Those things are valuable. We're gonna see that in a second. He said, but there's something beyond that. He said, I'm engaging with the spirit of God, that I'm engaging in spiritual realities, that I'm not just using human logic and wisdom. It's beyond that. He said, so if you're wondering what's going on, he's like, that's it. He's like, we're looking at it two totally different ways. He's like, you bought into the idea of just human logic and wisdom and reason. He's like, but there's a spiritual wisdom that goes beyond that and is above that and is better than that. He said, and that's, that's what as Jesus followers are called to engage with because we have the spirit of God within us. And he's calling it out. And he continues. The person without the Spirit, he says the opposite's also true. This person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. You know what that means? As Jesus followers who are following Jesus, who are listening to the voice of the Spirit, we're gonna do things that look absolutely crazy and moronic and foolish to people who are not following Jesus. Because he doesn't just use human logic and reason. And they can't understand them. And he continues. Because they are discerned only to the Spirit. Not discern better if you use the Spirit. It's not like this upgrade, like you see it a little bit clearer, another, another layer to the magnifying glass, like only through the Spirit. Only through the Spirit. And then, and I, just to go back to that verse, let's just look at this. This is just this word that sticks out that I have to highlight because if I'm reading this in my Bible, I'm highlighting this word because it shocks me. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit. So often I think we limit the Spirit of God. Well, the Spirit of God convicts us. So if you became a Jesus follower, the Spirit of God was obviously working. And the Spirit of God is a seal. He guarantees our inheritance. It's like this little passport that we get to take with us. And like, oh yeah, I have the Spirit. Enter into heaven, right? It's like this. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Things, plural. There are so many things the Spirit of God in us does. Here's your little homework if you're like skeptical of this, okay? Read the New Testament. Read every single adjective. Highlight every single adjective that is used to describe the Holy Spirit and have your mind blown as to what an intimate relationship with the Spirit of God is like. It is incredible. It will open your eyes if you do that. I remember doing that and just being totally blown away. And he continues. Verse 15. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. He's like, guys... Because the Spirit of God is now in you, it is a new lens that you look at everything and every arena and every behavior and every word that comes out of your mouth. You can judge and think through and wrestle through with the help of the Spirit that is within you. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. You know why I love that? He's saying, listen, listen, this doesn't mean that we just go off into a corner and say, I don't need logic, I don't need reason, I don't need education. I'm just gonna go to my prayer closet and hear from God and never know anything else. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, those things aren't bad. He's like, we just don't merely use that. He's like, absolutely, you should excel in every field that you're in. Be the best. Honor God. Let your work be your worship. Let your study be your worship. Know what's going on in the world. Use that logic. Use that reason. But don't forget, you don't just use that. Not merely human wisdom. You are continuously engaging with the Spirit of God to receive spiritual, supernatural wisdom. And then he says this, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, which was this Old Testament saying that was continuously said to the Israelites as they were trying to figure out what God was thinking. It's like, you don't know what God's thinking. You don't know what God's thinking. And Paul, having previously been Jewish and having studied that, he just kind of throws this out. He's like, for who has known this, right? He's like, Cause, well, well, why would we know what God is thinking? And then, and then he says this, he says, but... Memorize this verse. This is the one-liner. It's just a straight verse. You have to memorize this. This is so good. But we have the mind of Christ. 
He said, things have changed. Jesus came, died on the cross, and allowed us access to the Holy Spirit. He said, now you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. He's like, things have now changed. You are now connected. It says in scripture that his spirit testifies to our spirit. Now let's not forget the context of what's happening in this story. It's people who are disagreeing with Paul or taking sides. This person's crazy and this person's illogical and we really like what this person's saying. One second, sippy cup moment. Gosh, that's not efficient at all. A lot of work, a little payoff. Oh. So let's not forget the context. There are Jesus followers in the city of Corinth who are disagreeing with different pastors and different teachers. I'm with him. No, I'm with him. I'm with him. And here's what Paul's saying. Before you challenge me, let's make sure we're on the same grid. Let's make sure that we're not simply using human logic, but that we're tapping into the supernatural wisdom that's available to every single Jesus follower. The direct application is this, that before you judge someone's teaching, someone's theology, someone's practice as a Jesus follower, realize that there's a good chance that the disagreement that you're having with them is because one or both of you is actually exercising human logic and not supernatural wisdom. There's a 50-50% chance that one of you is not engaging with the Spirit of God is not relying on the way of Jesus and is actually leveraging the culture around them, the thoughts around them, and not allowing the Spirit to speak into them. And 50-50 isn't good odds. That's why one of my pastors growing up used to say, every disagreement is worth a coffee because it's so, so incredibly important that we not just write letters and we not just send emails and we not just send Facebook posts because when God had tension with us, he didn't send an email, he didn't send a Facebook post, he didn't send a theological treatise. He sent his son. He sent his presence to be on the earth, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, in the flesh with us. And as we learned that incredibly simple principle a few weeks ago, Jesus followers follow Jesus. Jesus always moved towards people who disagreed with him. With love, we do the same. In person, in the flesh. And as we approach them, we approach with humility, knowing that there's a chance that we may have erred and we may have leaned, as the Corinthians did, into human wisdom and been blinded by the fact that they were Jesus followers and they so badly wanted to be Jesus followers and to help people encounter the life-transforming presence of God, and yet they had gone off course. And so we show up, and we show up humbly, and we share stories, and we ask them about their journey, and we ask them what they sense the God, God of the universe speaking to them through the Spirit of God. We share what we sense the Spirit of God speaking to us. And then we always use Jesus as our grid. And let me tell you, some of the most amazing conversations I've had are with people who I've disagreed with. And as we shared our stories and we brought it to Jesus and we held Jesus up to that, it was amazing the things that happened when we're willing to get face to face and to share like that. And let me tell you why this is so important for us, Lakeside. Because if you look on your program, one of our core values is that we, wanna, we believe that everybody can change the world. That we believe that God does not accept this world as it is. That he has a much better plan and he invites us to be a part of it. And so our secret agenda, if you're just kind of new to Lakeside and you're like, I'm not sure what you guys are about. One of our secret agendas that's not so secret is we want to change the world. We want to turn this place upside down with the radical love of Jesus. And this principle that we learned today is so incredibly important to transforming the city, the region, the country, and the world that we take up residence because in history, whenever Jesus' followers turned the world upside down and did something incredible where the world took notice, it often, if not always, started with a disagreement between Jesus' followers. Almost every time. There's lots of times where Jesus' followers have disagreed on a certain topic. And some of you are like, you're not Jesus' followers. These things may not make sense to you, but you know this if you're a Jesus' follower, that in church history, there were times where the Gentiles weren't welcome. There were times, pardon me, where slavery was disagreed upon, where Jesus' followers said, no, it's okay to have slaves. And other Jesus' followers were said, no, 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 they're made in the image of God and we could never, ever have slaves. There were times where women were not even allowed to talk in church. 
And yet change happened, not simply by staring at a Bible and yelling Bible verses louder at each other. It first began with people's experiences, and I say that and some of you freak out, but just hear me for a second, of Jesus followers who knew Jesus, who had read about Jesus, who prayed to Jesus, and who encountered people. It's like, I know our skin color is not the same, but I just feel like I'm supposed to love you and treat you equally. And as they wrestled with that and they chatted with other Jesus followers, like, I'm sensing the same thing. And, you know, then went with the people that disagreed. It's like, are you kidding me? We have a verse. And it always has a verse, right? And it's just like, hang on, hang on, hang on. And they compared it to Jesus. And they're like, whoa. And what they realized every single time before they changed their minds is we made a grave error. We projected human logic and human wisdom onto the scriptures and onto Jesus. And every time world change happens, we take off our human logic and our human reason and we put Jesus back at the center. And we interpret it through Jesus. And the world is always better. You see, if we're going to read the Bible, Paul is telling us we need the Spirit. The Spirit reveals godly truth. You can read the Bible a hundred times and never encounter God. You need the Spirit. That's why I tell people, if you're going to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, that's incredibly dangerous. Because remember this, every single cult, every single cult, that makes the news, that makes headlines, that ends up with a Netflix documentary of the horrible things that happens, always has a verse or verses that they took human ideas and their human logic and their human reason and read their interpretation into the Bible. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to guard us from that. Because historically speaking, when Jesus' followers who accept the fact that they have the mind of Christ in them are at the forefront of some of the greatest changes that hit the world. Some of you are experiencing the fears of coronavirus right now. Yet 2,000 years ago in the first century, the Roman Empire faced some terrible plagues and they had no kind of health care the way we do. And yet Jesus' followers who were watching what was happening, Romans literally throwing family members who were sick and showing signs of the plague, literally throwing them out into the streets because they were so scared to get sick. And the Jesus' followers responding to the Spirit of God, chatting with each other, looking to Jesus and saying, yep, seems good to the Spirit and to us, would take those Roman citizens who'd been rejected by their families and take them into their homes and nurse them and care for them. And they literally have Roman guard, Roman governors who have reported this and saying, this is a embarrassing. The Christians are making us look bad. They're caring for our sick while we throw them out into the streets. Jesus people listening to the Spirit, bringing it to Jesus, changed the world. This week we just celebrated Let's Talk Day, all about mental health. Very important day in our culture. Yet 1,600 years ago, the first mental health institution was brought to, to be by Jesus followers. When a, there was a culture that literally, when someone had some sort of disability, said, the gods obviously don't have any favor on this person, and we should just kill them at birth and not tolerate them. And the Jesus followers were there, ready to care for them. Why? They're engaging with the Spirit. They're not just simply looking at the human logic and reason around them, but they're engaging with the Spirit. They're sensing something. They take it. They say, what is, does this, am I hearing right? Does this seem like the Jesus way? And they see Jesus talking with people and saying, they're like, well, why, why is this guy blind? Like, did God just curse him? He's like, this has nothing to do with God's will. God's just going to work great things in this moment. That when Jesus followers accept the fact that they have the mind of Christ and they tap into supernatural wisdom, the world turns upside down. And let me just bring us in for a sec because some of you are like, Mark, I love this. But it feels like you're doing this teeter-totter thing where you're taking the Bible and you're bringing up the Spirit and you're getting nervous. Can I just ease you for a moment? The Bible and the Spirit are not a teeter-totter. One doesn't go up and the other suffers and goes down. At least that's not the way it's supposed to be. Remember this, we have the Scriptures because of God's goodness. The scriptures themselves say that the reason we have the scriptures is because humans were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit authored the scriptures. And that means that the more you value the Spirit, the more you value the scriptures. In fact, what did Jesus say? All of the scriptures point and testify to him. That the more you engage with the scriptures, the more you fall in love with the Spirit. One of them is the map leading us to the other. The only difference is there's only one of the things in that equation that we worship 
It's not a thing, it's a person. It's the spirit of God. We value both, but one we worship. One leads us to our worship. Don't get that mixed up. This is so incredibly important. I love the Bible. Listen, we're spending like six, seven months in the book of Corinthians going verse by verse. I love the scriptures, but I love that they point us to Jesus. And we get to experience him through his spirit. I don't worship the map, I use it to get to the destination. But the caution is valid. Because I think if you look at history, you can simply see movements that said, well, we have the spirit, so we don't need anybody or anything else. It was simply the reality of God told me so. Some of you have been part of movements of God told me so movements, right? Where the leader just comes up and says, well, God told me so. And it's like, well, what about, and didn't Jesus like, God told me so. I got a word from the Lord and God told me so. And it's just like, just remember this. We are at war and there's an enemy and his goal is destruction and his tool is deception. And so the God told me so thing, that is incredibly dangerous. A friend of mine was telling me he went to a God told me so church for a while. He said, Mark, it literally ended with the doors being shut, chained, closed, and, it closed, and the pastor should have ended up in jail with some of the things that went on there. That's just human abuse. That's just humans using their own mind, their own logic, their own wisdom, and putting the God card on it, the God trump card, as I like to call it. But that's not the Jesus way. But out of fear of a movement like that, often we do the opposite and we say, well, we don't want to follow the spirit because then what if we misunderstand, we misunderstand, we just get rid of the spirit and just elevate the Bible completely. And that is also incredibly dangerous because we, dis, we un, unvalue, we do not value the spirit of God that, was, that is within us. Here's a great summary of a pastor once told me, he said, Mark, we need to trust God's ability to lead us more than the devil's ability to deceive us. We don't get rid of the spirit out of fear of misunderstanding. We just continually elevate the spirit, surround ourselves with godly community that can help us test it. First John 4 tells us, test everything. And we always bring things back to Jesus because here's the really cool thing. We have a litmus test. The mind of Christ will never contradict Christ. The mind of Christ will never contradict Christ. As a Jesus follower, as someone who wants to live in this way, who wants to help change the world as we do at Lakeside, we don't ignore the spirit. We don't lock him in the basement. We engage with him. We listen to his voice. It is so incredibly important, and we do that. And yet we always then bring it back to our community and say, does this line up with Jesus? Does this line up with who he is? Now just give me a second here because we're running out of time, and I just want to see how to land this plane. So just... I'm just going to practice what I'm preaching right now. Give me a sec. Okay. I'm going to invite the band to come up. And We're about to declare some amazing truths in this new song that we just sang. It's all about the good grace of God, how incredibly loving he is. And so one of the things that I'm gonna do this week is I'll put out a quick video with the end part of this sermon where I'm gonna actually, because some of you are like, I don't hear God's voice. I don't hear God's voice. This is frustrating. I don't hear his voice. I'm gonna walk you through, maybe I'll put on Instagram or something like that, but I'll walk you through some really simple exercises in growing that relationship. The brain is the one muscle that actually grows through relationship. And we believe that we have a relationship with the living God. So we're gonna give you some exercises to practice that. But here's the thing, and we're also gonna have a worship night, February 16th, which I'm super excited about because we're gonna worship with Michael Harris, listen to the voice of God together. It's gonna be so critical. Um, but here's the thing. You need to know that when you begin to wanna hear the voice of God, the number one lie that you're gonna hear is you don't hear the voice of God. That's the enemy. He's just defying scripture because we have the mind of Christ. And the second thing that you're gonna hear is that God doesn't love you. But the incredible thing you're gonna discover is so many people I talk to who actually start listening to God and you go through those exercises, they just say, the only thing God's telling me is that he loves me. It's the thing I keep hearing and I'm like, you just need to know that is the first priority. That is probably the thing he's gonna say to you every day for a long time as you start to pray. Whenever I pull up my prayer journal and I just listen to the voice of God, I just hear, hey son, I'm so glad you're here. I love you. I know it's been a while, but I love you. And so when you want to hear God's voice, hear Jesus' words that say, God is a good father, and when you ask for bread, he does not give you stones. And so I'm just going to declare right now against any lies of the enemy that say you do not hear God's voice, you do. The spirit of God is in you. You are mature. You have him inside of you, and he wants to speak to you. He wants to lead and guide you in incredible ways.
And every time the enemy tries to lie to you and say, he doesn't speak to you, he doesn't love you, you just send that to Jesus and say, Jesus is gonna deal with you. I'm engaging with my heavenly father and you're not welcome in this conversation. Let's stand together and let's sing this song with everything we have and declare how good a God we have. It transforms the way we listen to his voice. God's madly in love with you. And for those of us who are Jesus followers, he's closer than your own heartbeat. And he wants to speak with you. He wants to communicate with you. So claw at it, fight for it, engage with him. I'm gonna invite our prayer teams to come forward. They're gonna be up at the front of the crosses. If you want prayer for anything in your life, or if you're here and you're like, I'm not a Jesus follower, but I wanna know how to have God closer to me than my own heartbeat, come, come now. They would love to pray with you. Otherwise, newcomers, we'll see you out just to your right, the newcomer uh, lounge there. We're so excited to have coffee and snacks with you. And find Michael and invite him over for lunch and cook good Guelph food. Have a great week.